So, uh, thank you very much for coming this evening and giving up uh, a lovely summer evening to be here. Uh, it's a wonderful topic, and as soon as you start talking about pheromones, it conjures up all sorts of ideas of sex and abandon and excitement. And what I'm going to be aiming to do tonight is give you something to think about in the hot commuter summer months that you'll be experiencing shortly. And I have to admit that thinking about giving the lecture tonight, I did have an extra long shower. So what we're going to be talking about is the search for human pheromones. And what I'm going to be starting with is this. So how many people here have either read the book Perfume or seen the film? So quite a few of you. And you'll remember that it is a remarkable book. It describes a central character, Grunui, who has an extraordinary sense of smell. He can smell a perfume and dissect it into its constituent parts and then just with a range of bottles, he can put it back together again. And that makes him a very valuable apprentice. He has no smell of his own. And so Suskind has the conceit that he can walk through this 18th century town of Paris with nobody noticing him because he doesn't give off any smell. However, there are sinister things going on that justify the subtitle of the story of a murderer. And I won't spoil it by telling you any more, but it does involve effleurage and the search for the smell of a virgin. So that's perfume. And the story of pheromones in humans is less sinister, but there are some weird things going on. So the plan is to talk first about pheromones and what they are and what they're not, then to talk about an extraordinary story of how a corporation took over the idea of human pheromones, made it its own, and misdirected us for 20 years. And then finally, more optimistically, I want to give you an idea of where we might go next and what the promising ideas in pheromones might be, despite the challenges that they will certainly present. So firstly, what is a pheromone? It's simply a chemical signal transmitted between individuals of the same species. It comes from these two Greek words, transferred excitement, and the word is a very new one. It was coined in 1959 when the first pheromone was chemically identified, and they needed a new word. I've actually had an email from somebody who was a postgrad student in the lab when they were debating the word. Uh, this was in Germany, but he was a Greek student, and he objected strongly to pheromone, because apparently this is very bad Greek. It should have been pheromone, <laughs> but everybody in the lab uh, said, we'll never be able to say it. <laughs> and so pheromone is the one that took, and it is remarkable that that year is the first year that pheromone appears in the literature, and all the old words that didn't quite work all disappear and never to be heard of again. So pheromones are invisible signals, and we've known about them for a very long time. The ancient Greeks knew that a female dog sent out a signal to male dogs that would have them running for miles to find her. They knew it wasn't a sound, and they knew it was something you could transfer to a cloth, and then the male dogs would follow the cloth. So it was something probably like a smell. In a 17th century beekeeping manual, there was the very good advice that if you're stung by one bee, you should take out the sting and throw it away from you because the sting will keep it on sending out the rank humour, uh, which we would now call an alarm pheromone, and other bees will come and sting you. And that's how they do their group defense against bears and other vertebrates. And in the 19th century, you may have read uh, Jean-Marie Fabre, has some wonderful accounts of moths. He had a peacock moth uh, emerging from its pupa, a female, in the evening. And through the open study windows, 
males flew in from miles around, and he started to do some experiments. If he put a glass dish over the female, although the males could still see her, they ignored her. But if he put over a sieve or a colander with the air flowing right through, then the males had no difficulty finding her, although she was not easily visible. So that led Fabre to think that this must be something to do with smell. So he was almost there, but then he tried sniffing the female. And of course the smell is not noticeable by humans, but is highly noticeable to male moths of her species who are highly sensitive and evolved for that sensitivity. So also in the 19th century, Charles Darwin, in his other uh, big book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, treated smell in just the same kind of way as the peacock's tail. It was extravagant sexual display, largely by males. And he gives this lovely account of the crocodile. During the season of love, a musky odour is emitted by the glands of the crocodile and pervades their haunts. But he doesn't stop there. He also talks about smelly male elephants, goats, pythons, and even a smelly musk duck in Australia that you can smell before you even see it. So you could argue that what he's describing in this case is the success of the smelliest, although he never used those words. But the real problem was that although it was clear that probably something to do with smell was involved, the quantities were so small because the receivers were so sensitive that very little was needed that with the chemistry of the time, they could never be identified. And for that, we had to mention, as I mentioned, we had to wait until 1959. And that's when Adolf Budenant and his big team of chemists finally identified the female sex pheromone of the silk moth, Bombyx mori. So he'd been working on this for decades, and what he looked at was the fluttering of the male moth in response to the pheromone being released by the female here from her pheromone gland. And what you can see are these enormous feathery antennae which are covered with sensilla, with receptors for the female sex pheromone. He's enormously sensitive to that particular molecule. So this gave him the test of activity as he searched in different solutions extracted, uh, solvent extractions from the female in different alcohols and so forth. He could see where the pheromone was going in the different solutions by checking the male's activity uh, and response to these extracts. And that gives what is, we call in the field a bioassay. So what he was doing in finding uh, bombicol, which is what the pheromone turned out to be, he starts with a, a test of activity, the bioassay. He does lots of fractionations of the extracts from the female. And it was a very wise choice with the female silk moth because he needed half a million. With the chemistry of that period, he needed an enormous number to get enough material to do the analysis. And in the end, from that large number, he only got 12 milligrams of material, which is only a few grains of sugar. Having identified the molecules, he then synthesized them, he made them, and then to show that he really had a, found the right molecule, he went back to the bioassay, to the test of activity, to show that this really was the molecule that created the excitement in the male that the female originally did herself. Now, how do pheromones evolve? Sometimes we have a good clue to this, and in fact, this is a good reminder that pheromones work underwater just as well as in air. Now, by accident, some scientists in the States found that goldfish female pheromones are actually the same or very closely related to hormones. So how did this evolve? Well, if you're a fish in water, all sorts of molecules leak across your gills and also appear in your urine. And any mutant males that were sensitive to these Q molecules would get to the female first. And they would leave the most fertilized eggs to the next generation. And so there's great, selec great selection 
uh, among the males for greater smell sensitivity, but also greater specificity so that they don't have false alarms. And then finally, females will be selected to release more of these molecules to be sure of finding a male. And what we have there is a fully fledged communication system, a signal, and that's a chemical signal, a pheromone. So to recap, a pheromone in any animal, and as we've gone across the animal kingdom in all the years since 1959 with that first chemical identification of a pheromone, they've been found in all sorts of animals. Lots of insects, lots of mammals, fish, lampreys, snakes, almost any animal you can think of, a pheromone has been found in some example of that kind. However, Budendant was enormously lucky, although he couldn't have known it. The silk moth pheromone is a single molecule. If it had been two molecules, and he'd had to look in different extracts and combine them, it might well have taken him another 20 years. So we're lucky that Bombay coal was active on the males just by itself. It can be at short range, and that's something that often gets forgotten. Uh, that pheromones can act when animals are actually very close indeed. And there were some nice ones in mice where the male and female are nuzzling in part of the courtship and some large molecules that are not volatile get transferred in that courtship. What does seem to be true, and this is true underwater as well as in air, almost all pheromones are detected by smell. And that's for the good reason that it's much more sensitive than any sense of taste. So what are not pheromones? Well, smells are important to us as they are to every other kind of animal, but not every smell or odour is a pheromone. So, for example, um, we're actually quite good at recognising family members by smell. And the way that this has been tested is by getting somebody to take a clean T-shirt and wear it, and then another family member sniffs it and can distinguish it better than chance from a stranger's t-shirt. And you can control for the eating of pizza and garlic and all those other kinds of things that might have been other clues. There is even a suggestion from some Swiss work uh, that you may have seen reenacted in uh, one of the Robert Winston television series, where it looked as though students were choosing their partners on the basis of smell as smell demonstrating a difference in the immune system. For reasons we still don't understand, the immune system affects our sense, sorry, affects the smells we give off rather than our sense of smell. It affects the smells we give off. And by choosing somebody who smells different from you or different from other members of your family, you'll actually have stronger children. It's turned out actually quite hard to replicate. But it is what's behind a phenomenon called pheromone parties. And in fact, there's one happening uh, this evening uh, somewhere else in London, I understand. Uh, but you chose to come here tonight, and I'm delighted. So what happens there is, having worn your T-shirt, you put it into a numbered bag, and then put it on the table, and other people come, and you're doing the same to other bags. You open the bag, sniff the T-shirt. If you like the smell, then you hold it up and take a selfie, and these photographs go up onto a private website, and you can see who liked your smell, and also see who was the owner of the T-shirt whose smell you liked, and then you can take it from there. However, these are not pheromones, despite the name. Of course, pheromone is such a sexy word, it's not surprising they've used that as the name of the party, apart from the alliteration. But actually, these are for genetic compatibility, and it's all about individual smells. You couldn't distill one individual, sorry, one smell that would work for everybody. It's actually what each of us smells like. So it's not pheromones, but it is an interesting idea. So the big question is, is there a human pheromone to make you irresistible? Is there something that will make everybody at that pheromone party irresistible to everybody, not just to one or two people who like their particular T-shirt? Well, if you Google pheromones for sale, um, you get more than 400 hits, a site selling you human pheromones. Uh, there are lots of molecules. It looks very sciencey. There are often 
uh, white lab coats, as well as very attractive people, uh, models. And the molecules are either androsterone, androsterol, which come from pigs, or these two molecules, uh, androsterdienone and estrotrienol, which are probably easier called and and est. And you can think of them as the ant and deck of pheromones. The problem is that there is no scientific evidence for any of these molecules. So they're very proudly presented on these sites as a guarantee to make you irresistible. And I think the only way that they might work is through a very strong placebo effect. If you've spent several hundred pounds buying these, you have a strong interest and a good reason to be confident when you go to the singles bar, having put this on, to actually make the first step and perhaps have more success than you would if you were feeling shyer. So there could be a strong effect, but actually you could probably buy the cheapest of the ones on offer, because they're all, in that sense, the same in not having, any, not having any scientific evidence. So there's no reason for them to work, but your own feelings might actually affect how confident you are. So when I was researching the humans chapter in my book on pheromones, uh, the book is actually all mixed up. Some chapters are on sex, some are on territories, some are on how bees' nests and ants' nests are organised. So it's organised by different kinds of behaviour. But one of the chapters is on humans. And when I was researching that, I went back to the claims on human pheromones. And the story is a disappointing one for these two molecules. It's back in the 1970s, and some of the molecules had turned out to be probably a pheromone in pigs. It's in male saliva. Somebody found a little bit in some human armpits, and so the conclusion was jumped to that these must be pheromones in humans. But there was no scientific evidence that these were human pheromones. And I think what clinched it for experimenters was you could buy it in a can. And so there was a rash of experiments uh, in dentist waiting rooms, for example, where you'd spray some of the seats, and we could have done it this evening, uh, and see which sex sits in the seat. But the statistics were awful, and the conclusions were not really very valid. So there's no evidence that these molecules do anything. But what about the other molecules? And these are the ones that are most popular on those sites selling human pheromones. Well, it turned out there was no scientific evidence. I was amazed. It was, when you came down to the bottom of it, it was simply a corporation's claim in 1991, which had convinced the world that these molecules were human pheromones, and it wasn't just the websites selling the molecules, it was also lots of serious scientists. So how did a corporation hijack the science on human pheromones? That was 1991, we're in 2015. And to date, the hijack is still in progress. So what happened was a corporation based in Utah patented some molecules as putative human pheromones. And the molecules included these two and and est. The putative word is actually quite interesting. It's what I would call a weasel word because it means believed to be. So in a way, there was a warning in their original publicity that they hadn't actually proved anything. They were simply claiming that they were. But they did something really clever. The year of 1991 was the year of the publication of the paper that led to Linda Buck and Richard Axel getting their Nobel Prize in 2004. So 1991 was a special year for the science of olfaction. The corporation sponsored a conference in Paris, and who around the world in the science of olfaction wouldn't want to go to a conference there? So the big names in olfaction science were there. And I was giving a talk in Columbia University uh, last October, and at the end of the talk, my host, the professor, said, actually, I was there. And it really was the weirdest conference. 
Normally, scientists don't actually wear very sharp suits, but they were the sharpest suits he'd ever seen at a conference. And it turned out those were the lawyers from the corporation. And what happened was that there was lots of good science. There was a symposium volume of legitimate good science papers, but the corporation slotted their own paper into the set. And this was the paper. It was by Monty Blanc, Monty Blanc and Grosser, and they were sponsored uh, by the corporation, and they introduced the putative pheromones and a nest, but there were no details given in the paper of where these molecules came from. No details of how they were extracted, identified, and shown to be pheromones. When you looked for the methods, there was just a single phrase, which was the molecules were supplied by the Erox Corporation, and that's all you were going to be told. So, basically, there was no evidence that these molecules were pheromones. Now, nothing might have happened. It might have just simply disappeared, except that in 2000, there was an endorsement of the molecules by a leading scientist who was by that stage already famous for her work on pheromones. She had published a paper in 1998 on the suggestion that menstrual synchrony in women uh, in close association was in fact driven by a pheromone that you could collect from the armpits of uh, women at one stage of their cycle and affect the cycle of other women by putting it under their nose. It was highly contested at the time, but it got an enormous amount of publicity, and she was already famous, but really made her name. So when she used these molecules in a study of psychological state and mood in men and women, it gave it instant credibility to these molecules. And the only reason she used them was because of that 1991 symposium paper that had no methods so far as the molecule source was concerned. So what happened since 2000? And this is the hijack. There are more than 40 papers using these molecules, and these have themselves gathered hundreds of citations all over the literature. The studies are done by good scientists, they go into prestigious journals, and they usually cite this the particular article by Jacob and McClintock, and they even use the same concentrations. But there's still no evidence that and and est are pheromones. The trail always goes back to the paper in 2000, and from there it goes back to 1991, where there is no evidence presented. There is none. And without that evidence, I'm afraid it's junk science. And to give one example, there's a study uh, which uses concentrations of crystalline molecule a million times more than was ever found in a human armpit, and then does high-tech brain scans, and then makes all sorts of claims about differences between men and women and people of different sexual orientation. And that paper has been cited hundreds of times in medical textbooks, papers on sexual orientation, and it's even come up in medical advice on legislation. So it's junk science, but it has an amazing life of its own. Well, how did it all happen? I think the key thing was this top scientist endorsement in 2000. But other things were going on. If you uh, could buy and and est, and very quickly these molecules became available, as a psychologist working in a lab without access to pheromone research labs, and a good chemist to help you, you could do interesting work, apparently, on a sexy subject, human pheromones. Very rapidly, there was an echo chamber. So there was a growing literature that assumed that these molecules really were human pheromones. And nobody seemed to be going back to the source of this whole pyramid structure, the basic paper that had no evidence. And something else that was going on, well, you might wonder, how come all these people found something, and doesn't this mean there was something there? And the answer, which is causing a crisis across psychology and many parts of biology, 
is that positive publication bias, something of a tongue twister, simply means that what people are looking for now is something that is exciting, new, and a new positive result. That's how you get published. And you're more likely to be rewarded for that than for getting something right. The second thing is a lack of replication. You can't get a grant to repeat somebody else's work. It's already been done. And if you've got a negative result, if you couldn't repeat it, you wouldn't publish it anyway because that's not a positive result. So you get this amazing echo chamber, not just of people assuming that the molecules are pheromones, but actually only positive results get published, and it's actually quite easy by chance to get positive results. It's actually far too easy. So why would we expect humans to have pheromones in the first place? I think the main reason is because we're mammals, and mammals smell. Uh, dogs smell, we smell. If you ever have any kind of mammal in a house, um, you realise why stick insects are such popular pets. Basically, mammals smell. And we're unlikely to be different from other mammals. Everything else about our physiology uh, is very much the same as other mammals. The big reason, though, is that our smells, the smells we give off, change at puberty. And these are because glands that previously were inactive start to secrete lots of molecules. And they particularly secrete them into the areas that now have hair in our armpits, in our, in our pubic area, around the groin. And if we were any other mammal, if we were being objective and we had just been discovered, we'd be looking for pheromones. We'd be looking for pheromones because something that changes at puberty is likely to be something to do with being an adult which in many cases is something to do with sex. Now, it was thought for a time that our sense of smell wasn't good enough. But our sense of smell is actually really rather good. It may not be good at a great distance, and we wouldn't be able to compete with a bloodhound, but if our nose is up close, we're actually quite good at distinguishing lots of different smells. And mammals do indeed have lots of pheromones. They might be small molecules like these, but actually some big molecules, the ones that are transferred when the mice are nuzzling, that's ESP1, is a big protein that actually has to be transferred physically. And rabbit pups are a good example of a pheromone, or rather, the rabbit pup's response. It's a pheromone produced by the mother, and it's the same molecule in every rabbit mother. And after lots of uh, research, they managed to identify the molecule, uh, a control glass rod elicits no uh, interest from the baby uh, rabbit, the rabbit pup. But if it either has uh, m rabbit milk or just this molecule in water, the rabbit pup uh, starts to suckle and uh, tries to suck. So what I would argue is that humans probably do have pheromones, but we've been going up a blind alley misled by a corporation wanting to sell some molecules it had patented. And what we need to do is instead start, but do it with some real science. And it's actually a very good time to be doing it, because lots of work has been done on mammals already, and the techniques that are needed to identify molecules in very complex secretions have been worked out. So now is the time that we could do it in a way that possibly we couldn't have done as well before. So there were lots of questions, though, in starting out afresh. Well, which areas is the starting point should we look? And the traditional thing is to look in armpits. And as I confess in my TED talk, I do have particularly good ones, which I'm not going to share with you tonight. But armpits are the traditional place that people looking at pheromones have always sampled. Now, there is a good reason for that, and it's that these are the characteristic scent glands of the great apes, of whom we are one. So chimpanzees, gorillas, and humans all have these scent glands in the armpit, and that's different from the places that you find scent glands in other primates. So that's a good reason for looking at armpits. Where do the smells come from? Well, 
those glands that start secreting secrete odorless precursors into the armpit, and it's only the action of specialized bacteria growing on the rainforest of hair in your armpit that produce the smells that we know and love. And one very good way of getting rid of the smell is to clear cut the rainforest, take away the bacteria, and the smell takes much longer to build up again. But there is a reason for not looking specifically at armpits if you're looking for a universal sex pheromone for humans. And that's because about 20% of the world's population doesn't produce smells in the armpit. And they are people in China and Northeast Asia. 97% of the people there have a particular gene variant that means that they don't produce a smell in the armpit because they don't secrete the precursors. So there's nothing for the bacteria to work on. Coincidentally, this same gene affects the earwax. So you can tell before you leave this lecture, or do it from memory, whether you have orange or white earwax, and that'll tell you uh, how good your armpits are. Okay, so what other areas are possible smell sources? And I think one reason that we've not looked in these other places is simply embarrassment. It's quite easy to ask somebody for a sample from their armpit. It's much harder to ask them for anywhere else. But where should we look? And the answer turned out to be Icelandic swimming pools. <laughs> so all over their changing rooms, they have this sign, because basically it's in five languages that they don't trust foreigners. And they require every guest to wash thoroughly without a swimsuit, and they helpfully colour those areas in uh, red or purple, and those are the areas apart from the feet that also start producing the smells of puberty. So you take your sample, you then have to sort out the molecules and separate them and identify them. So you're probably familiar with chromatography, and you may have done this yourselves. Uh, if you take a spot of black ink, put it on a filter paper, uh, let it dry, and then dip this into water here, the water, as it travels up by capillary action, will carry the different dyes at different speeds and different distances up the filter paper, and you find, to your surprise, um, that what you thought of as a black dye actually gets its intensity from the combination of a variety of colours that are hidden within the black dot. Now, with pheromones, you actually use a different kind of chromatography. This is gas-liquid chromatography. And what you do here is take your mixture of molecules as before, inject it at the beginning of the column. It's carried through by a gas inside this heated oven. And by the time it reaches the detector, different kinds of molecules have taken different lengths of time to reach the end. And that means that when it gets to the detector, the different molecules form different peaks in the trace, the GC trace that emerges. Now, if Bundant had had this technology, he probably could have done it in a very short time indeed. And instead of half a million moths, because of the much greater sensitivity and this of this and other related instruments, like the mass spectrometry, he probably could have done it with a single moth. So it is extraordinary how chemical sensitivity for identification and separation has taken the field. So this is what you do. Put your sample through the gas liquid chromatography, but there's a problem. Mammals produce a lot of molecules, and what you'll see next is a typical mammal. It's a human armpit, and what you see is more than 700 molecules along the gas chromatographic trace, the GC trace, and your pheromone in question might be hidden among these little peaks. It probably won't be one of these big ones. And that creates a dilemma for anybody working on mammal pheromones, which is why not many people have done it. It's really hard. So how can you reduce the number of molecules you have to identify and compare? Well, the main way is to compare chemical profiles. And somebody called Milos Novotny uh, at the University of Indiana have pioneered this with mice in the 1970s. 
And what you do is compare males versus females and look for the peaks that differ. Since many of the pheromones are only produced if the male has sufficient testosterone, if you look at castrated males that no longer produce the hormone and then compare them with intact males, again, you can look for the molecules that are likely to be pheromones that are only produced by intact males. And that's been done with the goat. Now, during the summer, the female goats uh, don't uh, go into estrus, but when they uh, smell male goats, um, their hormones start getting active again and they start producing eggs. Uh, the castrated males don't have this effect. So some Japanese researchers tried to work out which part of the goat, the male goat, was producing the exciting smell. And it turned out it was the head. So the way they studied this was to put shower caps on the goats and they then put a molecular trap called Tenax under the shower cap and collected the molecules from the head of the goat and then ran these through the GC to see what was there. And this is the trace. They then asked the female goats, okay, which groups of molecules, which sections excite you the most hormonally? And it turned out it was this grey area. So they switched their focus to the grey part of the trace and blowing it up, you'll see there are actually, even within that, an enormous number of peaks. What's below is the castrated male, and you may just be able to see there's actually very little. But if you look at one of those peaks that's big in the intact male, if you blow it up, you can see there's a big peak in the intact male, but almost nothing coming from the castrated male. So that gave the Japanese researchers some targets, some candidate molecules to put into a cocktail. And in fact, what they did was to underline all the ones that appeared in the intact male, but not in the castrated male. Some 18 molecules appeared in the intact male, not produced by the castrated one, and they tested them in various combinations as a cocktail for the female response. And it turned out that just one of these provided most of the excitement to the female hormone cycle. But it didn't recreate all the activity. So what that probably means is that it's actually a combination of molecules that are the real pheromone, that is the communication between the male goats and the females. So what would we do with humans? Well, again, we compare profiles between adult males and females, but also what we probably do is compare adults with children and see what molecules appear only in adults after puberty. But there were lots of challenges. And the first of these is going to be culture. As humans, it's impossible to escape culture. It's also impossible to escape individual preferences and excitements. And it may be apocryphal, I've not actually found the letter yet, but Napoleon is said to have written to Josephine, some days away from home, Josephine, don't wash, I'm coming home. So he didn't want to lose any of her richness in the days in reaching back. But you can have too much of a good thing. And the Roman poet wrote, don't be surprised that no woman's willing, Rufus, one of his friends, they say a fierce goat lives in your armpits. And in fact, it is true that some of the molecules you find in human armpits, the really bad smelling ones, are some of the ones that male goats produce. They're actually the oxidation products of the ones that I've just been describing. So you can really have a goat in your armpit. So it is actually very hard if you think about the bioassays. They're always going to be overlain by what we've learnt and what we've picked up from our own culture. So the other thing about bioassays is you really need to understand the behaviour really well. And it may turn out that some of the things we're looking for are things that only happen with very intimate behaviour. And despite um, Kinsey and Masters and Johnson and the researchers who followed them, we still don't really know that much about human sexual behaviour. And one of the key things is that when we do bioassays, 
we need things that are biologically important. One of the things that has bedeviled behavioral research is that it's actually quite easy to find a statistically significant result, even if it's not biologically significant. And that's a real problem that we're starting to grapple with now, but it's something that will be very important if we work on these very difficult questions in humans. And ironically, it's the isolation, identification, and synthesis that have been so transformed by developments in chemistry that those are probably not the problem areas anymore. It's about what we're going to test. What is the scientific test for these new molecules we're finding? Another problem is the whole question of funding for science. We're going to be starting out something, and the way that grants are given out is for science that claims that it will find something exciting in the next three years. I think this is going to take longer. But even worse, olfaction is not a priority for biomedical research. And one of the ways that you can tell how important a society treats its different senses is by looking at the foundation date of the societies that people form to help people who've lost a particular sense. So if you do that for the UK, you find that the Society for Helping People Who Are Blind is 1868. The Society for Helping People Who Are Deaf is about 1911. But we had to wait more than 100 years to 2012 for the society, it's called Fifth Sense, for helping people who've lost their sense of smell. And that kind of level of commitment and appreciation is, I think, probably applied to the levels of research funding. It certainly doesn't seem to be an area that gets priority. And since pheromones involve smell, we actually do need to get more money for that. But where I want to leave you is with a possible pheromone that looks to me as if we might find it perhaps in the next decade, and it's the mammary pheromone. So human babies uh, respond to a pheromone. It's not been identified. It seems to be a molecule that's the same for every human mother. It so happens that it is actually the same research team uh, that did the work on rabbits and the rabbit pup. And the main researcher, Benoit Schall, uh, is married to a midwife. And I think this may have helped the research, but getting it, of course, through the ethical committees. <coughs> so this is a, a baby taking a, a milk meal. This is the areola gland. And these are the uh, bumps that are around all of our nipples. And when a mother is lactating, she produces uh, not only a bit of milk from these glands, but also a secretion from sebaceous glands that feed into the same duct. So this is Benoit Schall, the researcher at Dijon. Now, if you take the secretion from any mother and put it under the nose of a sleeping baby, what you find is that it will start to pucker its lips. It will also start to root, to move its head, searching for the nipple. Some babies also stick out their tongue in response to this secretion. And it doesn't matter which mother this secretion has been taken from. And that's the indication that it's a pheromone. It's just possible that this secretion explains why wet nursing works so well. That a baby will accept another mother who is producing milk, perhaps because there is a universal pheromone that all lactating women are giving off. One of the things that we can be sure of, though, is that of all the life stages of humans, babies are the ones that are least affected by culture. Now, it's not entirely true, because whilst you're in the womb, you do actually start to learn to like the foods that your mother eats. So if your mother eats lots of garlic, um, then I think as a mind did, then uh, you'll end up liking it. So one of the ways to have babies who are less picky 
is to have a very varied diet um, during your pregnancy. So, are there other practical applications of this? And the answer is yes. The researchers found that the more glands there were around a nipple on a woman, the more secretions she produced and the quicker her baby started to suckle. So it looked as though more was better. And what we do know is that a surprising proportion of babies find it very hard to suckle in the first few hours of life. That's distressing both for the mother, but it's also very dangerous for the baby who needs the nutrients, but also that first special milk meal, which includes the colostrum, which gives all sorts of antibodies and also lots of hormones. So if we could synthesize the molecule, having identified it, and then we were able to paint it around a nipple of a mother who was having difficulty with her baby, then we could perhaps get better suckling and, of course, put it on teats for premature babies in incubators. So in summary, I fear that we've been misled by a corporation, and that's led to decades of misguided effort by very good scientists. And what I would like is for people to redirect their efforts into real human pheromones. And I think we really do have them. They're going to be hard to find, but I think we need to start again. But this time, do it properly. Now, you'll find the full references to this talk, both in the transcript, from a link there to a paper. And this is the paper that's freely available on the web. It's open access. And this is the book, uh, Pheromones and Animal Behaviour. Thank you very much indeed. Indeed. <laughs>